And uh, so tonight, I'll uh, bring you two speakers as ever. The format uh, the same. We haven't been here before. Then basically we have one speaker, short turnaround to refresh your glasses, second speaker, and then the pizza's arrived down the other end. Uh, so we aren't expecting to have a fire alarm. There's no test planned, so the alarm goes off out the, uh, the way we came in. Uh, okay, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Dan. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for having me today at this day. Uh, I'm not sure how well this is amplified. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, cool. So, without any further ado, I'll just crack on a uh, bigish later. Uh, all the perils of uh, memory cliffs, uh, how not to fall, or if you decide to fall, no, don't do it. Uh, it will, if it sounds a bit uh, googly goog to some of you, I'm not sure it's a diverse audience. Uh, I'll try to explain as much as possible. Feel free to raise hands uh, and shout questions or catch me by the beer font later. Uh, so, processing data, obviously, it has happened. Uh, for, uh, or oh, it's been happening for many, many years, uh, our history of uh, civilization is actually, uh, some anthropologists claim, is the history of processing data. Uh, our brains, uh, the way they develop uh, our speech apparatus, uh, the way it evolved, uh, allowed us to, around 45,000, some people claim is between 50 and 30,000. Unfortunately, speech does not fossilize, so we cannot, we cannot really tell. But we can tell by uh, proxy various artifacts that were found. Uh, around then, speech evolved. And that meant that we were able to store our knowledge instead of just in our separated jars. I could have uh, passed the knowledge uh, to Nick about don't go to that water font, the alliance go to go to this uh, lake, it's much cleaner, much, much better, that sort of stuff. And by passing the word of mouth uh, from person to person, we were able to uh, establish the journey of the information storage. Obviously, that then led on to us uh, becoming Homo sapiens sapiens, according to, again, anthropologists, historians, uh, biologians, uh, biologists, <laughs> and uh, uh, following revolution that happened within the, this upper paleo, paleolithic uh, period was that we started storing our data not only as a word of mouth within our heads but also we started scribbling on uh, rocks, we started painting on caves, on cave walls and that's how we created what we now call culture which is this grand sum of our knowledge of the information that we possess as a, as a uh, society. And, and uh, sort of the ratchet effect of information and the knowledge is kind of self-perpetuating and self-swelling uh, phenomenon uh, sort of carried us across the millennia uh, up to this moment. So clearly the talk is positioned somewhat with uh, big data as a reference. And uh, initially this talk started as uh, this uh, study group at uh, at work, we have a big data study group, uh, at least in one of the offices, if not in, in, in many more. And um, we started talking about various technologies. Uh, our interest in big data was mainly uh, from the uh, engineering point of view. What technologies are being used? How can we utilize them uh, on various projects? And it became clear that there's a lot of hype around big data. So initially the talk was positioned uh, on kind of against big data. Now, uh, this talk uh, having evolved uh, is more kind of we do understand that there's a lot of data flying about. We can all capture just using our laptops connected to uh, whatever uh, processes uh, in the uh, wide world. Uh, we can capture lots of data. Uh, and I think the uh, talk is positioned around this kind of how not to become too uh, possessed by this big data hack, but still uh, keep processing data at speed and at volume. So, a uh, bit more about the hype. Uh, Apache Software Foundation uh, has, I'm not sure whether it can be seen, 39 projects under the term big data umbrella. In fact, this slide has been refreshed last night, and 
as of last night, it's actually 47. So within a couple months that I've been uh, sort of giving this talk, uh, they accumulated 11 new top level uh, projects that they would consider something to do with, with big data. Uh, on the funnier side, there's also this uh, game somebody created, Pokemon or Big Data. As you can imagine, there's uh, open source uh, efforts, have occasionally funny names, and somebody uh, made this uh, true, false, or Big Data Pokemon uh, kind of game. You can uh, sort of try it yourself. Uh, accept the challenge, and you'll see what a crazy uh, names people can come up with. However, to talk Honest, honestly, about big data, uh, people uh, talk about these four Vs. I'll focus in this in this talk mostly about the top three because they have heavy uh, engineering angle to them. Uh, however, just uh, quickly. However, the uh, sort of veracity is also uh, listed as part of the issues features. Uh, properties of, of what we call big data. So, firstly, onto volume, uh, and again, sort of uh, very sort of quick comic. This is, I think, uh, it, it, uh, it uh, sort of shows where I want to take this talk uh, uh, with regards to processing data. I think focusing on a useful amount of data, filtering it down, is much more beneficial than just accepting everything uh, sort of on uh, mass. So, not sure whether anybody can recognize that. This is from original uh, Moore's Law uh, paper, uh, <coughs> published somewhere in the uh, thing late 60s. Uh, and this is clearly a uh, well-known uh, law slash phenomenon observed in our ability to create and cram more uh, uh, transistors onto the silicon, onto the integrated chips, uh, which then results in us being able to process and store more data increasingly more. Uh, the scale is uh, exponential, so uh, obviously each step is actually uh, relatively doubling and the cadence uh, sort of around uh, 12 to, to, to 18 months. And the picture of the horse is, uh, I'm using this to point at uh, places where I think industry or parts of the industry played or placed a Trojan horse uh, to uh, scaffold the competition a little bit. And Intel obviously has published the paper or Mr. Moore has published the paper, uh, the industry accepted it, everybody knew that the uh, speed of silicon uh, processing is going to be doubling every uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, while only very few companies, initially only Intel, knew that the effort to ride that wave is so great and the expense is so great that you should only aim for the every second uh, sort of cycle of it, and very uh, few companies initially knew that. And as a result, very uh, quite few companies uh, or within the Silicon Valley that were uh, within producing uh, CPUs, memories, uh, just went bust because they tried uh, and failed to write every single cycle of Moore's Law. Um, another thing about Moore's Law, and in the context of big data, uh, I've heard somewhere uh, people saying that is the disparity between uh, IT spending globally and which is very sort of uh, almost flat linear growth versus the accelerated growth of our ability to process, store and therefore create data is where the big data technology sits. But in fact, it's the opposite and there's this uh, paper the economic uh, implications of Moore's law, which explains it clearly uh, that it is precisely the uh, ever increasing efficiency and cramming more transistors within our chips, being able to store more data, being able to process more data, that we can keep spending so very little, increasing it at, a, at such a very uh, slow pace, and still keep on top of 
the, the amounts of data that we want to process, the amounts of data we want to, we want to capture. Uh, so big data volume, um, obviously uh, too big to be stored and processed within one machine. So we're talking about distributed systems, uh, which comes at a great cost, uh, both conceptually uh, in terms of uh, hardware, in terms of networking equipment, in terms of paradigms that have to be followed uh, by the software vendors, by uh, software developers. Uh, tooling is uh, much more complicated as soon as we start distributing things. Uh, obviously, it all uh, started uh, around a few uh, well-known uh, online services, eBay, PayPal, uh, Google, um, sort of Facebooks and Twitters came, came a bit later, where suddenly people realized that uh, relational databases uh, are no longer up to scratch when it comes to processing the amounts of data created by uh, web, uh, sort of big web services. So we started talking about uh, denormalizing the data, we started talking about sharding, about scaling out uh, rather than scaling up. It's much cheaper to throw more commodity hardware at it rather than just keep buying uh, big mainframes. Uh, afterwards came NoSQL and it's all a bit of a moving target and I would like to uh, focus on that moving target, the fact that what's what didn't fit on one machine a couple of years ago, now uh, sort of machines can process. So again, in contrast to big data, what I would like to call biggish data is where we can use and utilize one machine, uh, be it beefy or not, depending on the size of the data <coughs> you want to process, the amounts, the, the speed of the data that, that is arriving. Uh, because it's all sitting within one machine, we can optimize it for uh, given hardware architecture. We can use uh, sort of very clever data formats. We can use uh, uh, data structures and algorithms that make perfect sense within uh, within single machine, which would not be possible, or uh, the wins would be diminishing because uh, as soon as we uh, were to distribute it uh, across different machines and and uh, sort of go over the network. So uh, because of that, we can avoid MapReduce and, uh, or, uh, or SQL dressed as MapReduce, which is kind of as soon as uh, anybody talks about uh, big data and processing big, large amounts of data, uh, Hadoop, MapReduce, or any technology that does MapReduce behind the scenes and exposes uh, itself as a, a sort of SQL of sorts interface. Uh, it also allows to avoid uh, streaming, uh, which is another paradigm in processing uh, large amounts of data, although it's sort of, uh, if uh, there are programmers among you, you, you probably used streaming and you probably used MapReduce uh, for uh, smaller problems, uh, smaller problems as well. Uh, I'm placing another Trojan horse in here. Uh, and the reason uh, behind this is that in 2004, when Google pro uh, published their MapReduce paper, this new paradigm of processing lots of data uh, using uh, this very clever technique of mapping and summarizing and reducing, and actually as a computing or computational model can be used to do all sorts of computations. And I think that's part of the problem behind MapReduce, but I'll I'll talk about the problems a bit later. What I want to uh, talk here about is that in 2004, Google uh, publishes MapReduce paper, and uh, uh, Yahoo and their research labs jump on, on top of it and start fiddling with it, create uh, Hadoop, uh, and uh, Hadoop's implementation of MapReduce create the distributed file system, and they start using it as their web indexer. Uh, However, Google much later admitted to the fact that by the time they published that paper, they already moved way away from MapReduce. They were happily disclosing it because this was technology that uh, allowed them to scale the problem of indexing the whole of uh, web up to a point, and then it started uh, tailing off. And uh, Yahoo, however, invested uh, lots of money and lots of efforts, having open sourced their biggest project, which now is Hadoop, and that's what spurred the whole uh, 
uh, frenzy of, of big data. Uh, and we can see now uh, where is Yahoo financially or as an as a entity on the internet, as a, as a company, versus where, where, where Google is. So that's sort of my uh, another, another level theory. But speaking about the volumes, uh, how about six terabytes of uh, processing uh, memory in four socket server? And uh, yes, that was uh, already back in 2013. And here we've got another beefy server. I'm not sure whether you guys can see from the back. Uh, you can have 12 terabytes of uh, main memory. And uh, prices are this evening. It says configure from around nine grand. If you were to uh, price it all up, <laughs> you come at much higher price. It is it is a lot of money, but uh, average salary of a, a big data engineer, someone who has uh, behind their belt the knowledge of uh, Hadoop, MapReduce, um, few of the SQL dressed as MapReduce technologies is uh, much higher than that. Uh, so if you were to give it to someone who is uh, sort of crafty and creative enough on your team, you possibly would be saving money rather than uh, sort of spending. And the costs of your big data effort uh, would, uh, that cost obviously, uh, the, the quoted salary does not include any hardware costs anyway, and you would be uh, Spending a lot of money trying to run a cluster of uh, of processing processing power that uh, uh, could do big data. It could go even deeper, further, depending how how handy you are with a with a screwdriver and uh, sort of manuals. You could buy yourself uh, such a motherboard. Uh, uh, this is being priced from a very famous uh, UK hardware uh, outlets, apart from memory. At the time of creating that site, I couldn't find price for uh, one terabyte of, of memory out of one vendor while in the US. I could have. And all in all, we're talking between 15 and 20,000 uh, pounds for a workstation that has one terabyte of uh, uh, main memory ready to sort of be thrown at various problems. And finally, a very famous hardware company that has a name similar. Uh, to uh, uh, brown condiment uh, is producing uh, hardware like that where a single workstation can have up to three terabytes of, of, of data of memory ready to uh, sort of be thrown at, at various problems. Uh, again, uh, I think they mentioned the price somewhere here. Well, if they don't, it starts at around two grand, but the three terabytes uh, versions are, are much, much higher in terms of. Uh, in tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, so that brings us to the mentioned uh, cliffs and where we could be falling uh, off them and how to avoid falling off them. It's a um, scale of uh, various events within a processing machine uh, scaled to human uh, units just for illustration. So if CPU cycle was taking one second, then the main memory access would be taking us six minutes, and that's still within that's still within the good part. As soon as you start talking about uh, processing anything within the big data, you are somewhere between here, like you're falling off the uh, storage uh, cliff, and you're moving onto uh, data available uh, via network. So this is exactly where, where I wanted to position the talk, the fact that we can do quite a lot with just main memories and perhaps main memory uh, and some clever uh, storage and we don't have to go all the way to, to, the, uh, to our networking interfaces. Uh, the second V in big data velocity is actually uh, the same problem, just a uh, sort of different side of the same coin. You either have a lot of historical data that you're trying to process as fast as, as, fast as possible, so you end up streaming it uh, at as much of a speed as you can possibly afford, uh, or vice versa, you're sitting on a process that is creating so much data that you end up dropping some of it, maybe processing uh, very rough uh, metrics, very rough uh, 
accumulations out of it and then storing it for sort of further processing uh, later on. Um, and in fact, dropping and sampling uh, are very much underrated in the whole engineering efforts that we would call big data. Everybody is talking about processing every single piece of information ever captured forever. Uh, while statistics uh, has uh, sort of proven and shown uh, and been tested uh, over centuries now, uh, where sort of clever sampling can give us as much information, as, as much insight with some acceptable uh, margins of error at much higher uh, speeds or at, at much lower efforts. And in fact, uh, a lot of clever databases, databases that we would uh, these days call uh, uh, big data databases, uh, do embed uh, techniques like that, where you can specify the acceptable amount of error or the window of, of time in which you want the answer, and uh, uh, sort of issue a query, and the query comes back within the given time budget or within the given error budget, uh, as much quicker, uh, much quicker back to you than if you were to process the lot. And uh, I'd wager that more and more products will be moving. Uh, in that direction. Uh, variety, it's sort of the discussion around here is exactly the same for both big and biggish uh, data. We no longer have uh, sort of rigid structures in which we shoehorn our data to. Uh, Hadoop is a distributed file system and it's exactly that. You can throw any files at it and any files uh, can be processed as long as you can write the processing. Uh, bits yourself or uh, sort of steal, beg and borrow from open source. Uh, and the same obviously could be happening with biggish data. You've got uh, sort of your disk, your machine, your big server, uh, and uh, the file system is, is uh, sort of exactly the same in both places. And this is the uh, Trojan horse here around the Hadoop uh, specifically. Uh, which is what I uh, talked about uh, earlier. So quickly, I would like to run a demo. It's just you'll have to, okay, we are in. You'll have to bear with me because I don't have the uh, screen in front of me and I have lost the feed. Okay, here we are. So I've got uh, downloaded from the internet um, all titles of the wiki, uh, Wikipedia articles as of 11, uh, 20th of November 2017. Uh, and if I was to show how much data there is, uh, it's about under gigabytes, 942 megabytes of uh, text. Uh, if I was to quickly show you uh, how long or what is the top speed that I can read that data from, from the file. Uh, uh, by piping it to... Uh, so this is the data. And by piping it to... The so as we can see, uh, under uh, um, sort of two tenths of a second, I can read <coughs> 40 uh, megabytes of uh, pure text from, from a file, and uh, uh, and uh, that's sort of the top of my performance that the hardware gives me. Uh, now, what I could start doing, uh, having having rubbished uh, stream processing, I can use piping, therefore creating a sort of pipeline or a stream of data that I can start uh, doing something with. So I could do, first thing in processing that amount of data is filter against something. So if I was to filter uh, everything uh, only to the lines containing Bristol, uh, yeah. Bristol, and then I was to do some Sort. And um, so the 
the last 10. So here are the last uh, here are the last 10 entries of, uh, of the processing pipeline. So what I could do now is I could ask only for unique entries and I could sort and I could sort them further. And again, only the last 10. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, characters that are being uh, uh, getting in the way. So ideally, I would like to uh, remove these characters so I can use a good, well-tested line editor. And I'll be removing them now. Uh, again, if it is Google to Gook, uh, essentially, I'm taking all the data that's being packed in and I'll be removing some characters defined here and replacing them with the characters defined in the second part between the uh, forward slashes. So I'd like to remove all the dots and, um, and the underscores and <coughs> commas. So, I would also like to break all of the, because uh, these are lines, I would like to break them into individual words. So I can use another uh, set expression. Uh, I would like to be moving that into a new line. So I'm essentially replacing any white space with a new line. And uh, is it? I do apologize, I only just noticed that it's not. It's not quite fitting the, the screen. Okay, so we've got uh, some entries there. Um, I would like to, the ones that get uh, sort of clumped into unique, I'd like to count. So I'm attaching, uh, and here we are, we have some uh, top 10 counts of words extracted from the lines containing Bristol from all the Wikipedia titles. Um, uh, obviously, you could go on and on. Uh, having rubbished stream processing in the earlier slide, uh, I would like to argue that you'll find more people capable of just experimenting with uh, some standard or downloaded uh, on top of the standard set of commands within within your uh, Linux uh, environment. Uh, and more people will be able and can comprehend how to process large amounts of data using uh, sort of Linux uh, data pipeline compared to uh, sort of data pipelines that would have to be explicitly programmed within any technologies that provide, uh, uh, provide piping as an as a abstraction. Uh, so this is first part of the talk uh, right, so move on to the second part uh, which is about sort of using the uh, the riches of computing science as a domain uh, the algorithms and the data structures created by many uh, clever people over the decades uh, and do something uh, interesting. It's going to be only a snapshot of of the greater topic, but I'll I'll get to to that when when we get there. So when data isn't too big, uh, as programmers, uh, very often we are uh, tasked with finding finding the uh, sort of top n elements, uh, establishing membership of elements within a set of captured earlier elements, counting these elements, uh, and 
when we can all do it within within the uh, confines of sort of programming language and, and main memory, we use these uh, deterministic data structures like uh, hash map, hash sets, sets, dictionary, bugs. Each technology will have their own parlance for, for these. Uh, however, when the data isn't yet fast but is uh, big already and having exactly the same tasks, we end up storing uh, that data further and further from the CPU. And sort of this is where these falling of the cliffs uh, happens. Um, and when it's big and fast, we have to start being uh, a bit more clever. So uh, in the world of software and software products where the competition is fierce uh, and milliseconds added to uh, to the response times or megabytes added to the amount of data being uh, one has to download or install on the on the infrastructure could be bad news. And we as technologists often have this attitude of oh, like if it's not gigabytes, like who cares? Uh, but for some products and some uh, some domains, uh, essentially every millisecond, every kilobyte matters. So if you were a web browser uh, vendor and your web browser was slower by, let's say, 10% than the competition, people would move away from, from using your web browser just as a word of mouth and uh, sort of the very often and very common way of rubbishing off all, all the software products. The same with uh, operating systems on our smartphones, uh, desktop operating systems, uh, chat clients, and so on and so forth. So, people have come up with uh, this notion of probabilistic data structures, or with the idea of uh, probabilistic, probabilistic data structures, and specifically, I would like to hear uh, tell you about something called Bloom filter. So, I'm not sure whether you can see it from, from up there, but essentially having Again. Uh, having uh, 10 million elements uh, which are integers uh, would take us uh, 40 megabytes to store. Again, it's not a massive problem unless you are hardware restricted or you are in this world of fierce competition. Uh, using Bloom filter with uh, accepting 4% error, you could have the notion of a membership within that set, having spent only 0.6 megabytes. And there are various other uh, things we could be doing with Bloom filters, accepting perhaps more error, or maybe uh, uh, using other strategies, and eking out uh, sort of or not eking out too much resources of constraint, uh, constraint uh, hardware, or otherwise uh, using it in the products where, where the, uh, every megabyte uh, could matter. So what is Bloom filter? It's essentially a bit vector, very, very long. Uh, sort of the size of it, obviously, uh, can, can grow uh, at infinite uh, as long as, as your memory allows you. And what happens is every element that Bloom filter would like to see gets hashed multiple times. So on this example, we are hashing uh, uh, elements using uh, three hashes, X, Y, and Z. Uh, and uh, each of these hashes generates just the position on this bit vector of the bits that will get flipped. So the red hash or the Y hash will flip that bit and that bit and one of those at, at the beginning and so on. And then when presented with element W to establish whether this element has been seen in the past, whether it has been hashed by all those, those uh, hashes, uh, we only verify uh, whether at least one of the bits resulting from hashing this element is, is turned to one and we only have to verify one, or um, sort of, we verify all of them to be 100% sure. But even if some of them are flipped to zero, that could be a result of uh, hash clashes. 
and I'll try to explain it in a bit more detail. So basically, Bloom filter is this awkward minimalist. It will say yes with some probability by passing a given element, but when it answers no, it's 100% sure that this element has not been seen before. And it will answer yes, uh, its error rate uh, of saying yes will increase the more data is being thrown at a balloon filter of a, of a, fixed, of a fixed size. Uh, and as soon as we start increasing the number of elements that we want to store within balloon filter, we want to expand the space uh, of that uh, bit vector, but we will also want to increase the number of hashes that we perform simultaneously or on the same data element to uh, flip increasing number of bits uh, to sort of to, to assure us that given element has been seen. So some interesting properties. It's absolutely bottomless. You can keep throwing data at it as long as you want, as long as you can accept increasing number of the false positives. And uh, union and intersection of two Bloom filters is as simple as performing logical or, or logical and, respectively, uh, on this uh, bit vector, providing that the size of the vector stays the same, the number of hashes and the hash types that are used are the same. There's absolutely uh, no notion of removing or unseeing elements from the from, from filter. So, where Bloom filters are being used, for example, in content delivery networks and big, uh, these big, big vendors that sit at the heart of performant web, uh, they do struggle from the issue called one-hit wonders. So they have massive uh, in-memory caches storing uh, files that are being served over the internet. Uh, and they promote given resource to that uh, cache when they receive cache miss. So essentially, if I open a website and that website has a, I don't know, uh, React of, React, uh, which is JavaScript library uh, of a certain version, and that site uh, references the React uh, uh, JavaScript file, that file could be served by a content delivery network, providing that the content delivery network has it. So or the performance increase in my case would be only if they have it hot in cache. And if they don't have it hot in cache, they'll save it, obviously. It results in cache miss, it goes to a disk, fetches the file, places it in a cache, and serves it. The one hit wonders problem is that very often, quite a sizable chunk of the resources requests requested by our browsers are being requested only once. So you end up pulling something from the uh, disk onto cache for nobody else's benefits. Uh, so what they did is they placed a simple uh, Bloom filter uh, fronting the uh, cache. And they would populate the cache only when the uh, element has been requested before, within, say, 24 hour window. And Whenever they turned that on, you can see that uh, uh, sort of their disk writes per second have dropped by uh, 50%. And for someone who is running a uh, big uh, content delivery network, that is a massive boon. Like the life of the disks uh, is measured in terms of uh, sort of read and write operations, right? Um, Another usage for Bloomfilter is famous browsers, starting with uh, Google Chrome, but actually anything that was being built, and I'm saying in the past tense because that's no longer the case, uh, being built uh, using uh, WebKit, open source, uh, HTML rendering engine, uh, was benefiting from Bloomfilter. Essentially, uh, again, starting with Google, they would have indexed uh, all the sites that were deemed harmful to our devices and as soon as uh, your device asked, uh, was asked to visit or the browser on your device was asked to visit uh, given a URL, if there was a hit within the Bloom filter embedded within the browser, it would present you with, with a massive warning asking you, are you now 
do you know what you're doing? Uh, this site has been uh, listed as it could be harmful. Uh, and what's amazing is that the entire set across the internet of the sites that were deemed harmful to our devices, uh, the Bloom Filter index of these websites was in single megabytes on uh, the uh, desktop browsers. So again, absolutely not massive amount of data to um, be able to index and uh, make a decision about random URL that someone could be could be typing into into their browser. And I've got another demo for which I need to run. Eventually, um, I'll make the uh, text bigger. So, I see at the top? Yeah. Okay. So I'm bringing, I'm stealing uh, shoplifting, uh, Bloom filter from a uh, library called Google Guava. It's a, it's a Java uh, implementation of Bloom filter. Uh, it's a very mature and uh, mature piece of technology which is very easy to program and interact with. And I'm going to be running a very simple test. I will be creating number of random strings, <coughs> uh, each of which will be 16 characters long. And I'm going to create these four tests. I'll be creating Bloom filter, which expects 2,000, or was told you will be expected uh, to uh, store 2,000 elements and I will uh, store in it only 1,000 elements. The second case, uh, sort of matching the number of elements uh, to store and uh, number of elements uh, thrown at it. Third case, where uh, the number of elements to store far, well, outstrips by a factor of 10, the number of stored elements, and the opposite case. Uh, I'm telling the filter I'll be storing only 100,000 elements, but I'll be storing 1 million. Uh, these are not essential, but what's essential here is I'm creating this Bloom filter uh, telling it that I'll be passing it strings uh, encoded in a, in a given encoding uh, with expected number of elements. So uh, at the creation time, I have to tell it, create yourself, and I uh, would like to store, let's say, 10 million elements. What's very interesting is I'm passing the accepted error rate to, to this Bloom filter. So I'm saying uh, not 0.1% uh, of the error rate uh, is acceptable uh, for this number of elements. And what it does behind the scenes is it creates number of instances of very harsh, uh, very fast hash algorithms. Uh, it creates that bit vector. And as I keep typing uh, data through it, it will uh, keep in indexing and, and running. And there's this uh, verify and print method here, and it will kind of print the details for each of these uh, uh, tests uh, I'm going to be running. And uh, we should see some properties. So if I go and I just hope we can get to. So it has run all of these tests. And for the first case, uh, again, this is just kind of uh, sort of printing out what has happened as we run uh, the cases. Uh, in the first case, expecting 2,000 elements, uh, having seen 1,000, uh, the false positive probability of seeing an element is under, is, is basically very low. So I 
in my test, I have captured one of the random strings that have been generated. That's the captured string. And I have mutated it by moving the last character mm -hmm. one uh, step up. So instead of K, we moved it to L. And uh, the claim is that the filter should not contain the mutated string. And it has uh, returned true, as in the filter does not contain, contain uh, the uh, mutated string. In the second case, exactly um, sort of the capacity of the filter matches exactly the number of elements I asked it to store. And as we can see, the uh, false positive probability is around uh, 0.1%. Uh, that I've asked it, to, uh, I've asked it to do, and again, uh, it should not contain, uh, or it should contain the first of the of the strings, and should not contain came back as true. Uh, second case, asked, I asked it to uh, store ten million elements. Uh, it has seen only uh, one million, and the probability of the false positives is that like I think those are rounding rounding errors of, of the uh, doubles that are being used rather than the actual probabilities. And again, should and should not contain came back as true. And the last one is the opposite one. Um, here, since we've thrown 10 times more, suddenly our uh, probability of seeing false positives uh, is all the way to 99%. And we have seen the mutated one. I'm not sure, it's perhaps not highlighted that the previous tests where highlighting should not contain the mutated, while here it uses the case of test should contain mutated, and the switch between the two cases is if the uh, false positive probability is above uh, fifty percent, uh, I expect to see it. Basically. And that is it for the bloom filters, and I am not sure whether we still have some time. No, you're done. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Time for questions? Yeah. Feel free. Well, just following on from this, what would be your incentive for not just setting a huge filter expecting number? Is it the time to do the ingestion? Yeah, exactly. Time? Yeah, ingestion time would be a bit longer because uh, the filter would be applying more hashes uh, so to hash index. Would be longer, is that what uh, the, the bit vector would increase, but also the number of the uh, hash functions applied to a given element to be indexed by the filter would also increase. So the ingestion time would... Do you have some tool to sort of optimize that? To uh, what probability you need to get to? Uh, you you could, some, some yeah, databases you could, have that as an option? Yeah, you could try not within this API. You would have to throw... Um, what would you call it? Um, a profiling tool. Any profiling tool for any uh, sort of uh, programming language or technology stack would be able to answer your questions. Whether, like, uh, what is your time budget to index, let's say, given given number of, of elements? Uh, you could apply very simple timers within within the hardware that are available. Kind of give me the system time before I index ten millions. Give me the system time after I index ten million. Uh, and comparing the two, if you can live with the inaccuracies of these, uh, it would give you some indication. Uh, presuming you've run this before, I was just wondering if the, you've ever bothered to find out what the actual bit string vector length was for each of those. Uh, I did not uh, bother to find out. It, yeah, it would be interesting to, uh, to find out. And, and the same with uh, memory, right? It yeah. would be interesting to see how much memory does a Bloom filter that's been told it's going to have 10 million elements <coughs> and have to 1 million elements. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, is the usual problem of the size of objects within uh, within uh, memory. These Bloom filters will be uh, using and sitting on top of various other libraries, either external or internal within uh, Java ecosystem. So obviously, at what point the tree of uh, references you would consider as essential for the existence of the Bloom filter, and at what point would you uh, draw some uh, cut off to say, well, uh, sort of we shouldn't be counting, let's say, string implementation within the platform as a 
uh, as a size of the object in memory, unless it is the actual uh, memory. If you see what I mean, I, I, you wouldn't I'm count the class in the actual bit, bit length, exactly oh, okay. of the actual film. I just put this one. Any more for anyone? Going right back to the start of the talk, yeah. um, you indicated that you thought that big data is basically a hype, as I understand it. Could you say anything more about where that hype is coming from? Who are the people who stand to benefit from oh, yeah. so I would. Uh, firstly, I'd like to correct. Uh, I don't think it's just a hype. Like, clearly there are uh, processes on the planet uh, that will produce vast amounts of data, and that data does get stored and does get processed. And if you're running any uh, big uh, system, any big website, let's say your uh, hardware logs of a cluster of 10,000 machines will start living in, living in the realm of big data. If you were to, say, do some cross-cutting concerns and try to find out across all of those machines like what's happening, uh, let's say, have I been, uh, have there been attempts of uh, exploiting my system that is exposed to the internet? You would end up having big data problem on, on, on your hands. And obviously we can't avoid it. Uh, I think where I try to uh, position this talk is that because there's a hype and where the hype comes from, it's hard to tell. I think technology is hype prone uh, more than many other domains, especially within uh, IT. Everybody would like to run their shop, just like Google does, just like Netflix does, just like... And we've seen it all. And uh, I personally am guilty of it as much as, as anybody else. I would like to get my hands on the technologies that the big boys are using. Who, who doesn't? And I think, I don't know, uh, other part of it could be uh, the existing notion within IT of uh, uh, CV-driven architectures. Some people choose certain architectures just because they want to have exposure to a given technology, which makes them more employable or more specialized, more uh, uh, more attractive on a job market. So, I think I think it's multi multilateral. In the earlier example, you gave about biggest data, and you mentioned more of the Unix uh, commands. So, is it like uh, Unix programming with sed and awk? It is required for biggest data? No, no, no. Uh, it's, uh, my very bad attempt at uh, pipe processing uh, these Wikipedia titles is just an example that you can, if somebody told you uh, write a hash table or you, you end up, you will have a hash table in your software that is going to be storing uh, one gigabyte of data. That would sound scary. It would sound scary to me if my boss came to me or the project I was on, the client said, we're going to have uh, the problem of storing, processing, and having hot in memory one gigabyte of data. Like that would, I would take a step back saying, oh, that's, that, could be, that could be difficult. It could create challenges. Uh, so uh, my attempt at uh, uh, sort of pipeline processing uh, using just uh, uh, Linux, Unix command, command line, uh, it was to show that you can achieve quite a lot with pre-existing tools and obviously I'm processing relatively fast uh, unfortunately I sort of I didn't get to time these commands but uh, one gigabyte of data has been pushed through some pipeline uh, and the results were coming back at like under a couple seconds I would, I would wager. Obviously you could mess up that, that pipeline and you could ask for like without that initial filtering for Bristol, I would be getting every single line of that file through the pipeline. And I think cutting it, dropping the data very early on, obviously also illustrates techniques that are used in, both in big data world as well as uh, just uh, sort of general common sense uh, processing. If you can filter very early on and just focus on the on core of the project, if you wish, uh, then that's where, where you end up having so yeah, just an example of, no, it's not necessary. I'm not claiming you have to use Linux command line and you can call yourself biggish data scientist. Yes, yes, yes. Like for the file <laughs> transfers, uh, use IBM Connect Direct mechanism. Okay. From one group to another. So uh, like this was also about to transfer data, so it can be, that mechanism can also be used for transfer huge. Uh, oh, absolutely. But uh, 
having used uh, some mechanism that allows you to transfer data from node to node, you're already suffering from going all the way down to the network stack, it being chunked into network packets, shifted across however fast your network is, it's not as fast as uh, your local disk, right? And then bringing it back up and having it processed somewhere else, right? And so that is big data problem, or that is distributed computing problem. If you could do it all within one machine, like you, you're cooking. Uh, can the filter handle typos, uh, like search or Bristol? Uh, yeah, you could. I mean, uh, again, it's down to. Uh, do you mean that pipeline uh, that I used uh, the Linux command line for? Or the uh, yeah, or is there a, a known way that you can handle uh, fuzzy searching? Fuzzy uh, sort of not within the tools that uh, are used in that pipeline. So grep, you have to specify regular expression. If you can express your fuzzy search as a regular expression, like again, you you're good to go. Um, if you were to do like proper fuzzy logic, kind of fuzzy notion of elements being or matching something or being within a set or not being in a set, I personally don't know any uh, command line tools that would allow that. But that's not to say there aren't or that you couldn't, you couldn't create one. How much memory did you have when you ran that cell? Was that on your local machine here? It, it, yeah, this is, this is my local machine. Uh, this is, uh, because I'm relatively handy with a screwdriver, it has 32 gigabytes uh, of memory. But uh, it's a uh, sort of out of the shelf of, <laughs> of the shelf uh, laptop. Uh, I bought it sort of relatively thrashed. It has i5 uh, quadruple core, uh, and I've thrown a um, sort of SSD disk at it, and 32 gigabytes of memory. That's it. So it's not it's not top of the line. I would wage um, half of you here probably have more performing laptops. Is there an easy way to resize a balloon filter? So for example, no, you, no, you there, can't. No, so you can't. have to know beforehand the size of your data. Yep. So for example, in Google's case, they know the entire size of, and it doesn't have to be the size of their web index, it has to be the subset of it that they consider harmful, right? Yeah. Yep. It, and it's a bloom filter that has been created and trained or sort of populated and then frozen into a file and then being brought up uh, in the memory of, of the browser, or was being brought up in the memory of a browser. Uh, what they do now, which is also interesting, is they, do, they use tree data structure, but not uh, T-R-E-E tree, uh, T-R-I-E tree uh, for storing these, which is... Uh, it's a prefix, prefix tree and they have, uh, it actually stores the data uh, entirely. It's not any hashing of the URLs that are considered harmful. They actually store all of these. Uh, and uh, tree, spelled with I and E, uh, has this property of heavily compre compressing the uh, textual data or data that can be expressed as a, a string of bits. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to take two minutes to swap the laptops over and we'll get going again. So feel free to uh, refresh your glass. And